now that we have now that we have an industrial revolution, uh, we're going to talk about how the, the world economy starts to become a world economy, a global economy, uh, how different parts of the world are going to become now interconnected, but it's not going to mean that all parts of the world will benefit equally from this relationship, okay? Of course, the majority of the benefit is going to go to those places uh, that, that originate the, uh, the Industrial Revolution, like England and so forth. All right, so um, we've already mentioned how the Industrial Revolution creates a tremendous need, how the Industrial Revolution is going to create a tremendous need for raw materials. All right? And the need for these raw materials is going to create economic relationships between the industrializing parts of the world, like England and Northwest Europe, and those areas of the world that have the raw materials that those industrializing nations need. All right? And when we're talking about these raw materials, uh, we're going to talk about things like, like cotton and rubber and mined metals and eventually precious metals. So it's going to bring a relationship between Northwest Europe and these, you know, lesser developed parts of the world. And the industrialized powers will work on exploiting those regions just to produce those raw materials. And there's going to be some serious impact, a uh, serious negative impact for those parts of the world that will be exploited. Typically, it's foreign investors and foreign companies that are going to be making the profit off of the, the production of these raw materials in these developing lands, whether they be in Africa or South Asia or uh, in East Asia. And so those areas' markets would be slow to develop on their own. Guys, a market is any place that goods and services are bought and sold, all right? So, like, we have an effective market system that we live in where we can buy and sell virtually anything we want within our community. These places of the world that were being used only produ to produce these raw materials for European markets, they were being only used to produce uh, raw materials for European markets, they were owned by foreign investors who may never even have stepped foot into these places, and so the wealth derived from the production of these raw materials was leaving these areas. So if you have any wonder today, why does, like, for example, Sub-Saharan Africa, or why does South Asia, and uh, even though South Asia and Southeast Asia are quickly advancing in, uh, industrially, but why are these places slower to develop than other parts of the world? It, in, in large part, deals with how the industrializing, colonizing powers treated them. So there was very little actual investment outside of these raw materials in these regions. And I'm talking about sub-Saharan Africa. I'm talking about India. I'm talking about a place like Egypt. I'm talking about Southeast Asia. All right? Let's talk about, in one example, we'll talk about Britain and, and India for the, the production of cotton. Now, as Britain starts the Industrial Revolution, it began, the, the, the first products being produced within an Industrial Revolution, England, are textiles. When I use that word textiles, we're talking about the production of cloth, okay? So, it, cloth production is the, the birth of the Industrial Revolution in England. And if you're going to be producing a lot of cloth, more cloth than you've ever produced before, because it doesn't have to be hand woven. It doesn't have, it's now being produced by machinery and it can be produced 24 seven. You're going to need a lot of cotton. So England went looking for cotton and they got cotton from primarily three places. They would get cotton from America. They'd get cotton in the later 1800s, more from Egypt. And they'd get cotton from India. Welcome, Connor. As we have a, an esteemed alumnus popping in just to, to live the good old days of a Adobe boring lecture. So here we are. Uh, we may be short on chairs, but you're welcome to come all the way over okay, here. No you might even get on the Adobe cast. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> That's a lifelong dream. Would you like to say hi? Oh, um, hello, Adobe cast. All right. Well, wait, here. There she is. Oh, it look, moved. Look, look how we roll these days, oh. right? And then eat. That's so like BB-8. I, 
Huh? Oh, BB-8. I thought, okay, I do know that. I thought you said A as in the letter A, and I was like, I don't know what the lingo of the college kids these days. Okay, BB-8. I got gotcha. you. All right, anyway. So we're going to talk about India and their relationship with, with England. Now, we mentioned last, last unit, I guess we could say, that England was spreading and, and starting to uh, become very involved in the trade networks of the Indian Ocean, right? And then in the late 1700s, England fought a little war with France. Uh, it lasted about seven years, so we called it... Seven years. Yeah, very good. That's a good name for a war, right? French and Indian War. It was the French and Indian War here, but the Seven Years' War everywhere else, all right? Um, and part of that war stretched into India. And ultimately, England won, and England began to grow its influence in South Asia. By the mid-1800s, India has become the crown jewel of the British Empire. India is the most important colony within the British Empire. And for, for one primary reason... They produce a lot of cotton for British textiles. Now, it's really important in the 1860s, for example, for Britain to have a place that it can get cotton from that isn't the United States. Why? We've got a little war going on. So Britain starts receiving less cotton from the United States. They've got to go elsewhere. They go to India. And India becomes the primary producer for British cotton in the, uh, the late 1800s. All right? Now, what does this mean? It means some like, wealthy landowners, some landowners in India can make a lot of money if they start producing cotton. But they were using their land for other things, like what kind of stuff might they grow in India? Rice. Rice. Like rice and stuff like that, that people like, can actually eat. Well, what's the problem with growing cotton? You can't eat it, okay? Stick a bunch of cotton balls in your mouth. You won't enjoy it very much, all right? Candy. <laughs> yes, cotton, okay. Touche, cotton candy is good. But cotton candy is just sugar magically transformed. Uh, and I know a lot about this because I had one summer where I worked at Riverland Museum Park and I was their chief cotton candy producer. So I am, I am well aware. Yeah, oh yeah. It was, it, was a, it, was, it was a big deal. It was a big deal. What's that? Because they tore the amusement park down. There used to be an amusement park on Van Dyke between uh, just south of Hall Road. No, uh, That place was sketchy. That place was sketchy. Let me tell you. Um, anyway. Because they let 16-year-old me operate the uh, Ferris wheel, and that was not a good thing. <laughs> but anyway, we, we press on. So India would become the primary producer for British cotton. And, Britain, and Indian landowners, Indian landowners would say, yeah, we can make more money selling cotton to England than we can producing rice for our own community. And so farms began to be converted to cotton production rather than food production. Cotton production is very harsh on the land. Um, so India is going to have some disastrous consequences for this. In the 1870s, in 1876, um, India will suffer from one of the worst famines in its history as, as uh, millions of Indians will starve to death and die because Indian farms are spending their time producing cotton rather than food for Indian people. And this uh, will spread... Uh, through pretty large areas, especially in, in northern India, uh, where the, the famine will be the worst. Yes? We're talking 1876 to 1878. Uh, yeah, well, any famine is a food famine, I guess. I mean, I guess, okay, we could have, like, you've finished watching all the shows you like, we have a TV yeah. famine, but, but usually when we talk about famine, we're talking about, like, literally being hungry. Uh, so people will be starving to death by the millions in India, and it's largely because of the, the transformation of Indian farms into to cotton-producing farms rather than agricultural-producing farms. And so how can a, can a factory in England now, because it's never happened before, like, this is a butterfly flaps its wings kind of thing, right? You've heard of the butterfly effect? Yeah. Now, stuff is happening in England that is impacting people in central India. And that will, that will never go away, okay? Now our world is even more interconnected, but it begins during this, this era. I had a hand in the back. I didn't have a hand in the back. Okay, we're going to talk also about uh, Africa. And this grisly picture, you have a couple Christian missionaries with three Congolese men, men from the Belgian Congo. And you, you may or may not be able to make it out, but they are holding in their hands the severed hands of their, uh, of their Congolese brothers.
Belgium, Belgium during the late 1800s, and this is a wild story, the king of Belgium wanted to have a colony. And he's like, uh, like a, what's her name, Violet Beauregard? Or Veruca Salt? Which one's the rich annoying one? Veruca Salt. I, I want it now, Daddy. Well, the king, of Ing, uh, the king of Belgium, a guy named Leopold, wanted to have a colony of his own. And he arranged, essentially, the purchase of the Bel what became known as the Belgian Congo. And Belgium began to control the Congo, but like other European powers controlling colonies, it was largely to exploit the natural resource production in the Belgian Congo. And for the Belgian Congo, it was primarily uh, rubber, rubber that they were producing. And the Belgian, uh, the Belgian uh, controllers of this colony were, were particularly harsh to their colonial holdings. They would place severe quotas on the, the producers uh, to, to go out and produce certain amounts of rubber. And if they didn't meet their production, they would suffer from beatings, torture, and, and even mutilation. As hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Congolese would have limbs severed, hands severed, to prove as an example to others to work harder for their Belgian controllers. Yes? It, it, absolutely, it absolutely does not, and, unless you feel that you have like an unlimited population and, and you're willing to do this to some to intimidate the rest. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't know. I mean, there's not a whole lot, whole lot of humanity in thinking through of this. Um, by the end of the era of the, uh, the Congolese uh, rule, or the Belgian rule of Congo, um, upwards of 10 million Congolese will be, will be killed by their... Belgian controllers uh, during this rule. That's half of the population of the Congo. And it's all to export, to, to produce rubber, to export to industry. And rubber is a thing that you don't really need much of before the Industrial Revolution comes around. Like rubber gaskets and all these little things that we'd be putting in machinery. Rubber is a hugely important commodity um, and that's what Belgium is, is working towards and these are the people that are going to be suffering uh, for that. Uh, Europeans will also try to force open new markets. You need raw materials from these markets so you could produce the industrial production that you're looking for. But then you're going to produce, like eventually, you know, before the Industrial Revolution, you would live in maybe a farming community in England and you'd be like, man, I like these pants. I like these pants so much because they're my pants. They're my only pants. I'm going to wear these pants day in, day out until I can't wear them anymore. And then maybe I'll get lucky and I'll get another pair of pants. And then the Industrial Revolution comes along and you get these women working in, in these factories producing more and more cloth that can be turned into more and more pants. And now people aren't going to have a pair of pants. They're going to have two pair of pants, or four, or a pair of pants for every day of the week, and possibly underpants to go under their pants, right? And they might even, they might even have, like, if they're especially rich, they might have more than seven pair of pants. Raise your hand if you own more than seven pair of pants to your oh, name. Yeah. I'm talking sweats and jeans and dress and all the rest. Anybody think you got more than ten? More than 15? More than 20? You're one human being. And, and Emily knows this because she's in college right now. But college, you, you want to accumulate as many t-shirts as you can when you go to college. Because more t-shirts can stretch the, the time between you having to wash your clothes. And so if you can have like 10, 15, 20, 25 t-shirts, that can be huge. Because you only want to go home once a month if you have to, right? I go home like twice a semester. Okay, and even better. So she's got like 60 t-shirts. You'll go away to college. They will give you t-shirts left and right, right? You want to you sign up for a credit card? No. You want a free t-shirt? Yeah. I'll sign up for that credit card. All right? So this is the industrial age, right? This is the industrial age. These factories are producing nonstop. And eventually, the people of England are like, you know what? I got enough pants. I can't fit all these pants in my drawers. Wait a minute. <laughs> now I'm confusing, because drawers is another word for pants. I can't fit all these drawers in my drawers. I don't have enough closet space for these pants. But the factories keep chugging stuff out. So now we need to use the rest of the world not just to exploit them for raw materials, but to use them as markets to purchase the production. 
This is where India is going to be especially important. India is going to produce the cotton. This is crazy because Indians, believe it or not, used to make their own clothes. Indians are going to produce the cotton. The cotton is going to be shipped to England. It's going to go into British textiles to turn into cloth and be made by, by shirt makers to be turned into shirts. And then that stuff's going to be sent back to India for Indians to buy. Uh, flash forward or spoiler alert, we're going to eventually talk about how Gandhi, uh, one major protest that he had uh, in the independence movement that Gandhi was pushing was, hey, Indians, we used to make our own clothes. We should do it again. We'll talk about that at a later year or a later date. So we, the British started selling the finished products back to India. But this was the crown jewel of them all. Because China, what did the Qing dynasty do to China? What? This, no, this is the crown jewel, Tyler. <laughs> what, did, what did Qing, how did the Qing dynasty feel about the rest of the world? They wanted to be more isolationist. Remember, they, they, left, uh, they left European traders to only a couple trading ports on the south of China, like Macau, right? Do you guys remember where Macau is? It's in my barn. Very good. So Qing China wanted to keep outsiders out. But Britain and France and Germany and eventually the United States, they would all look at China and they'd be like, whoa, because what does China have more than any other country in the world? People. More people, and people means markets to sell things to. All right? So we will talk at a later date about Britain first and France and Germany and the United States eventually opening up China. And they opened it up in a very interesting way. They addict a lot of Chinese to a new drug that opium. previously wasn't in China called opium. And it's through that that a conflict will come called the Opium War. We'll talk about this more at a later date. But eventually China will be open, bringing new markets to European finished goods. Uh, I've got a hand somewhere. Yes. How did they react to China's isolation? I, um, yeah, um, I, I don't know if there's a whole lot of reaction to Chinese isolation. Uh, we prefer it that way. I yeah, guess. yeah, they, they Until the French cool. And, but yeah, by, by the late 1800s, you've got the French coming into, into here, and you've got actually the Japanese taking over Korea. But we'll talk about that at a later date as well. Uh, one last note. In addition to rubber and in addition to cotton, uh, mining industries are going to be really important for European industrial powers in these uh, distant parts of the world. So with the Industrial Revolution, there became a greater need initially for coal production than for iron production. Remember, the coal to fire the, uh, the steam-powered engines, and the iron is what you produce your steel out of. But later, especially during the second Industrial Revolution, we see the mining of other metals, particularly something like cotton, or cotton, uh, like copper. Copper for like the copper wiring for electrical wire, or copper wires for the telegraph lines that are being now stretched uh, between cities around the world. And then down in South Africa, and this picture is from South Africa, the mining for precious metals like gold and eventually for diamonds. And so the local populations will be exploited to become the miners for British companies that are going to be looking for gold and diamonds in South Africa. This, just like the Opium War, will result from British contact with, with China. We're going to have another war that we'll talk about at a later date called the Boer War, B-O-E-R, where the British are attempting to gain, gain control of South Africa for one reason and one reason alone. South Africa's got access to diamonds and gold, all right? So we're going to see some conflicts arising out of this expansion in, in uh, global markets. Questions, comments, concerns?